I'm Pat Porter, uh, Extension Entomologist in Lubbock, and I would like to take 12 slides to show you the status of corn earworms resistance to our Bt toxins in corn as we enter the 2020 growing season. We've had Bt corn and cotton since 1996, and our resistant management plans for preserving these toxins were designed to keep them effective for 20 years. We're past that time now, and several of the older toxins now have a significant amount of resistance to them. And that has consequences for control of corn earworm and cotton bollworm, which is the same species, just by different names, uh, in both corn and cotton. And if you're a sweet corn grower and you use BT corn, you've already noticed that the older toxins don't work anymore, and we'll have some data on that. The work, so this presentation presents work from 2019 field research, and it really tells us where we are uh, right now in terms of these resistance factors. This shot was taken last year, 2019, uh, in BT sweet corn. Cry 1AB sweet corn. You can see five of the seven larvae in the tip of this ear. So we, we know these older BTs have failed. So last year we, we took on a, uh, an experiment that has been done in 26 different locations in the U.S. and in Canada, headed by uh, the University of Maryland. And this is planting five different types of sweet corn in two hybrid families, and then counting the numbers of corn earworm coming off of them. Uh, we grow them and pick them at just the right time when they're completing development, take them in the lab, and then count the insects. And we had a lot of insects, uh, and Dr. Dively from Maryland thought we had an extreme population, but in fact, this is pretty normal for us in the Lubbock area. So let's dive into the data. This table presents the results kind of in a nutshell. And we have two hybrid families. One is the obsession group and the other is providence and attribute. These types of corn differ only by one thing, presence or absence of BT. They're called isogenic lines. Other than that, they're identical. So it's the BT genes that make the difference and there's really no other genetic difference. Let's look at the Obsession 1 and Obsession 2 family. Obsession 1 has no BT. Obsession 2 has uh, Cry 1A105 and Cry 2AB2. 1A105 is kind of a, a composite synthesis in the lab of three different toxins. And what we see is that Obsession, the non-BT, had an average of 40 uh, corn earworm larvae per 25 years. The BT, Obsession 2, had 72, <clears throat> nearly twice as many, which you would think is, is not going to happen, but, but this is real. And it's, it's been shown uh, in recent research that these corn earworm larvae, when they're on a BT that no longer kills them, lose that instinctive uh, cannibalistic behavior so more and more of them will coexist in the ear than if they had been on non-BT corn. And that's what we're seeing here. And that's why Obsession 2 has nearly twice as many larvae as the non-BT. The two columns to the right I'll get to with some more slides, but basically it's looking at the developmental stage of the larvae uh, on these ears. Let's look at the other hybrid family. Providence has no BT. Attribute is the older BT, is Cry1AB, and Attribute 2 is Cry1AB and VIP3A. VIP3A is the new toxin on the block. And what you can see is that Providence had an average of 46 corn airworm larvae per 25 years, but Attribute, the BT, had over had 100, more than twice as many. And it's the same phenomenon we saw in the Obsession group where those caterpillars are, don't fight each other because they have lost that cannibalistic behavior. These graphs explain the, the two columns on the last slide a little bit more clearly. And what it is, is developmental time on BT toxins and, and on non-BT. 
When Bt resistance first shows up, there's a developmental delay in the insects that have the resistance alleles. Eventually this kind of catches up. And what we can see on the left-hand graph is that for the attribute series, the Bt corn in purple has a third instar is the most common at the sampling date. Fourth instar is the most common on the non-BT. So there's only one instar difference in these pests, whether on BT or non-BT, and that's not much. That's a couple of days. So there's no big developmental delay. And if we look on the plot on the right <clears throat> for the obsession group, it's again about a one instar developmental delay on the BTs as compared to the non-BTs. So this is really not very significant as far as developmental delay. Dr. Dively has been doing this sentinel plot work for about 15 to 20 years. And it was long enough ago that he started that he could assess the resistance allele frequency and phenotypic frequency, which means how many in the population are resistant. Uh, back when this corn technology first came out. And for CRY1AB, about 28% of the population were resistant at initial introduction. But now, uh, in 2017 and 2019, 91% of them are resistant. For 1A105 and CRY2AB2, at the beginning, about 19% were resistant. Now we're up to 86%. So it's very clear from Dr. Dively's work and our work that these CRY1 and CRY2 toxins are no longer effective. VIP3A, the new toxin on the block, when it came out, had a resistance of about 0.6 individuals per 100, 0.6%. Um, now, 2017 to 2019, it's about 1.9%. So the frequency of resistance is going up to VIP3A. If you're an organic corn grower, you might rely on sprayable BT formulations to provide corn airworm control. We haven't done the research on these products, but given what I just said about the CRY1s and CRY2s failing, um, it would be reasonable to expect that the, the sprayable crytoxin products no longer have efficacy. And that would be Agri, Dipel, Javelin, Thuricide, and Centauri. We don't have field data for this, this, so I'm not sure they don't work, but that would be a reasonable assumption. We would love to do these trials to find out. So here's where we stand today. If you're a sweet corn grower, um, we've, we've already demonstrated these older sweets of toxins no longer work effectively. And so that leaves you with VIP3A if you want to rely on BT as your primary uh, earworm control tactic. In that case, uh, there are two types of BT corn available that have VIP3A, and that would be Syngenta's Attribute 2 series and Syngenta Attribute Plus series. The other types of BT sweet corn are still fine sweet corn, um, but you're going to have to plan to spray them as if they did not have BT. For field corn, essentially now we've lost the older toxins. For corn earworm, VIP3A is still highly effective, um, but it turns out corn earworm is seldom an economic pest of corn. In field corn, it's a tip feeder, and it eats kernels in the tip and rarely does any other kind of damage, except that recent research has shown that it may make uh, mycotoxin problems worse if, if the environment such that mycotoxins are going to take off. If you have that tip damage, it might make it worse. So in that case, if you're concerned about it, as they are on the coast, um, a lot of people are growing VIP3A corn. It, it might be a good idea. Um, as far as the control of the other caterpillars in corn, the older toxins still do a pretty good job. Um, and VIP is not essential. I would say unless you're in the fall armyworm zone down around Lubbock and you're going to plant late, then you can expect a heavy fall armyworm population and VIP would be a really good idea. The other case is uh, if you're up north around Dalhart and you have to deal with western bean cutworm, you should know that VIP corn is the only BT that can still control western bean cutworm. 
VIP3A is now being put in corn and cotton and it's going to be grown on a large acreage. The corn earworm will have two generations on corn on VIP and then it will the next generation will go to cotton where it's the cotton bollworm and it will be selected again on VIP3A. That is a lot of selection. So corn growers can really help slow the development of resistance by planting the refuge that's in the stewardship agreement. And essentially there's three different types. The agrisures have a 20% structured or block refuge, and that's because it's VIP plus one other toxin. Leptra has a 5% structured refuge because it's VIP and two other toxins, as with Tricepta, also a 5% structured block refuge. And then tr Tricepta rib complete is a seed blend at a 5% mixture. So it's very important to preserve VIP to follow these refuge requirements. Thank you. Uh, I hope you have a profitable season. And if you need to get a hold of me, my email is p-porter at T-A-M-U.